Welcome to the podcast where passion and purpose collide. We are on a mission to interview women and the occasional token man about how their passion and purpose have collided to create healthy relationships and profitable businesses. I am Elizabeth Denham here with Rebecca Monet. We are the co-founders of the Coterie for Women and here to entertain you with our roses and thorns as we usually do. So Rebecca, you've had quite the week. <laughs> yeah. I hope they're entertaining oh, anyway. Maybe we're boring the crap out of people. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is a really bizarre one. I didn't even tell you about this one, Elizabeth. Oh, surprise. So I have discovered Marketplace on Facebook. Oh, and fun. I love it. I love it. And of course, I'm furnishing a massive house and I came from a small house. So I'm looking for particular things and I found these two absolutely adorable high back chairs that'll make a great conversational area in the family room and they were just one of a kind kind of chairs I fell in love so I set up an appointment to go see these chairs right and I pull up and two dogs come out of the <laughs> field not only two dogs come out of the field so I'm assuming if they're running free they must be friendly dogs right, right? You think? that's what I would think so they literally come at me and one of them takes a chunk out of my inner thigh i got a bruise that big from holy this. cow right so i'm like in shock two women come out the door <laughs> and they're screaming at me knowing i have an appointment i'm going to be there at a certain time put your dogs up right they're screaming at me to get in so i don't get hurt more right and i'm like part of my brain is going shouldn't you be yelling at the dogs instead of yelling How many at the dogs are they they were i guess just little mutts i mean oh. big mutts medium-sized dogs mm -hmm. so i go in the house so i go in the house no apology right mm -hmm. they go into instantly selling these cute little chairs which of course i'm already in love with before i got there no no do you want to take a look to see if there's blood right. nothing and finally i said could I use your restroom to see what's going on with my leg here? And, is it the same? I, is it the same side as your broken leg? No, it's the other leg. Oh no! So now you have two issues. Yes, leg. Oh, so I, go back, I go back to look, and there's all these wonderful, positive thinking things on the wall, and I go back, and they go right back into the pitch. So I make an offer for the chair. One of the girls is going. Whoa, 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 and the other one is quiet as a mouse. Oh. And the one that's going blah, 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 is the sister of the one selling the, the chairs. Mm -hmm. And I make an offer. And it's a very fair offer um, for the chairs. And the quiet one simply says no. <laughs> she doesn't say, you know, well, that, that's not going to work. I'm in this kind of situation. We have another offer. How about this? She, she just simply says no. Huh. <laughs> and part of me I'm like this isn't even a negotiation you your dog just about killed me you should be giving me your that's chair. what I was thinking I she better you. give those to you real quick just to keep me accommodated and right? appeased right? I couldn't believe it Elizabeth I'm like what happened to social intelligence what happened to <laughs> empathy and compassion you know I would have said oh my gosh we put you through so much Rebecca Yes, of course, we're going to give you $25 off of these chairs. Yeah. So right? did you get the chairs or was that the end of it? By that time, I was like, I don't want the juju from those chairs <laughs> in my house. <laughs> you don't want the bad energy coming from that chair to your house. Wow. So did you just walk? I the, yeah, I don't care what the sign said, you know, all this positive thinking all over the house, because clearly they're not positive thinkers at those chairs now were cursed and <laughs> I'm a, so did you just walk away I walked away I I don't that's yeah. not me I'm a buyer uh, that that's not me but I just thought no apology no empathy no I just anyway that was my yeah my well, that's a rough my, start to your your new house not yeah. in addition to all the other rough starts that you've been having exactly 
Stop the good news. I hope you have a rose to to make it a little. Yeah, I'm starting to move in. We're starting to move in into the house. Closed yesterday, so that's the that's the rose after minus the cute little chairs because there are other cute little chairs out there. You will find. What I think. Yeah. What I (laughs) think. That's terrible. I, I feel bad. Yeah. And I wasn't even yeah, there. I told you my bruise, but it's in a very sensitive area. So okay, yeah. Well, we won't we'll do that. Imagine. Okay. I'll spare you. I don't know how you <laughs> would get your leg up to the camera anyway. No, no, I couldn't do it very well. You know, it wouldn't be too pretty anyway. <laughs> I, what was your rose and thorn? Well, as as it often happens, often happens, I, my rose and thorn are the same thing. Um over the last week, you know, it's the end of the year. This this episode is going to air in the beginning of the year. But as 2020 is closing, um, I have talked to a lot of women um, for the magazine and we're getting the January issue ready. Um, and I think I've had at least three women cry on the phone with me. Um, and not in bad ways necessarily, but it's just emotional ways. I, I think a lot of people are hitting a wall. Things are wrapping up for this year. There's an emotional toll that the year has taken on us all. People are going up and down with their business or they're stuck at home or all these different things. And people, professional women at high levels who would not, I would, I would imagine would never normally do that have been very vulnerable and honest. And you say, how are you? And people are actually telling you now, instead of saying, oh, I'm fine. They're like, well, I'm not so great. I'm hitting a wall. I'm emotional. I have half my Christmas decorations up and half are in boxes. I'm like, me too. Um, so the, the thorn is that we're in that place of hitting that wall communally, I think. The, the mm-hmm. rose, I think, is that we are having more, uh, we're solidifying relationships better. Like, I feel like I have, I feel like some of these women who might have been a business acquaintance or associate are now becoming my friends um, because I know where they are and I know how they're feeling and I know the struggles. And, you know, clearly they're not things... They don't even say keep this to yourself, but you you would because it's a respectful conversation to to protect what they're going through. But the the numbers of women who I've spoken to who have shared that kind of vulnerability and enabled me to do the same, um, and just be able to say out loud in a professional relationship, I'm not great. Yeah. You know, I I think I'm sad that we're not great, but I think it's a gift that we're not great together and we're able to talk about it. Um. I love it. And it's everything that we founded the Coterie for Women, our, our mission, mm-hmm. right? It's to bring that transparency and some realness and support um, and authenticity to relationships. And even though this COVID is an ugly monster, it really has brought, like you said, crazy wonderful blessings where we're getting to see the hearts and minds of one another that we haven't before because we've been busy head down building businesses raising families juggling priorities and now all of a sudden we're getting the real human being behind that successful franchise owner or the successful business person we're getting to see the real people it's so cool it really is. And yesterday I interviewed uh, a woman named Noelle from Pizza Hut. She's a uh, works for a franchisee in California. And she was talking about having navigating those things and being more sensitive when people are not okay. And yeah. saying, she said, I've said to people who are just hitting that wall, go home, take the rest of the day and take tomorrow off if you need it. And another uh, person said that they have mental health days sometimes where they all just take a day off on a Friday or in the middle of the week and they have made uh, some counseling available to their people. So I think that those are healthy, positive things that we probably should have been doing all along. Um, And I hope those will stick around because I think it's, sometimes you're not okay, but that doesn't mean that you're not able to perform your job or good, you know, it's, it's not a deal breaker in a professional setting to be able to recognize that we all have bad days or bad periods of time and help each other through that while still respecting you as a professional. So I think if, if anything can come out of, of this year in business, that to me is, is a great lesson and a, and a gift. Yep. Relationships. And that's yep. based on being able to share. Um, so what a wonderful blessing. I love your rose and thorn. Mine paled in comparison to yours. <laughs> 
Thank you. Well, it just hit me the other day because I think we've all, you know, I, I've had not the best week of my life and you've had some struggles with your house closing and we've all been, I think the emotions are heightened and it's just nice to, it's nice to recognize that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like a roller coaster. It's like, and now I have a dog bite. Oh, you have a dog bite and that, another was my son's out of quarantine so we are so freaking happy it was it was not fun feeding him with with a tray on the floor in front of his bedroom door so <laughs> oh, thank goodness you yeah, things are getting better right that's we're just going to keep saying that things are getting better <laughs> absolutely well until next week with another roses and thorns uh what a great conversation thank you for sharing those things We'll see you next week for Roses and Thorns with Liz and Beth. Welcome back to the podcast where passion and purpose collide. We are here today with a very special guest, John Hayes, who is the Titus um, Chair for Franchise Leadership at Palm Beach Atlantic University and the Chair of the Titus Center. Um, he's an advisor. He's a coach. He's a consultant. He's he's an author. He's been published. The, the list goes on and on. So I think we need to just get right into the meat of it um, and, and not waste too much time um, and get into the interview because we have so many things to talk about. Um, so, John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, first, I think we wanted to talk about you have such an interesting background um, from where you started to where you have landed um, and the, the weaving in and out of, of life. Um, you want to give us a little story, a backstory on, on how you got where you are today? Yeah, I think that the, uh, if somebody had said to me, you're going to be where I am today, everybody would have laughed. Teachers, parents, family, everybody would have laughed. Uh, because even my mother said at one point when I was graduating from high school, I hope you'll be able to get a job pumping gas at a gas station. <laughs> and I'm glad my mother was wrong. Uh, she really loved me, so that sounds pretty harsh, but uh, she was concerned for mm -hmm. my future. And I'm glad she was wrong about that because there are no pumping gasoline jobs available <laughs> anymore. Exactly. Been gone for a long time. <laughs> so I, uh, I always wanted, I, I, even as a kid, I was writing. I would write greeting cards. I would write letters. I would write stories. And in high school, that came out that I wanted to uh, write. And then, uh, so I thought, well, you know, what would really be good, just get a newspaper job. Uh, I read the local newspaper. I thought, gee, I, I can be the Ed DeGraw of the future. Ed DeGraw was a columnist for my local hometown paper. So my, I, I knew in high school, I was, I was going to study journalism and um, get a job on a newspaper desk or so. I thought. And then, so I love writing and I loved learning about that. And I got to be really uh, good at uh, newspaper work. And I did, I worked on newspapers from as soon as I graduated from high school, I just got lucky. The local paper needed an assistant sports editor. And I was the sports editor of my high school paper in my senior year. And so I got that job. And what a blessing that was. So I, I got to be good at you know, writing under pressure, writing under a deadline, writing 250 words or 5,000 words, whatever needed to be done. And I went on uh, to, to teach then at Kent State where I got my undergraduate degree. And they said, we'll pay for your master's degree if you'll teach introductory writing. And so I did that. And I really discovered the passion was in the classroom. I really wanted to teach People. But I wanted to also be somebody who could do it. I could not just teach out of a textbook. I could actually go do it, then bring my newspaper article in and dissect it for you and tell you why I did what I did. And then eventually Temple University in Philadelphia said, we'll pay for your PhD if you'll come and head up the magazine writing program. By this time, I had been writing for magazines in addition to newspapers. And so I went to do that, but you made no money as a teacher, which is why I eventually had to leave uh, Temple. Uh, I left because in 1985, I was making $15,000 a year as an assistant professor uh, at Temple University. And you know that was just impossible. Yeah. And so I freelanced and I was at least able to double my income. But one day, the, the, how it got to franchising, the university called and said, professional education division called and said, would you like to make $65 for three hours on a Saturday morning? <laughs> okay, yeah. doing what? 
<laughs> uh, any course you want to teach in our professional ed program, what would you like to teach? And I said, I want to teach people, business people, how to write a book to promote your business. Mm. And they said, oh, that's different. I said, yeah, that's what I want to teach. Now, I had never done that. <laughs> and I had never taught that. And, but I knew it was right. I knew that was the future. If you want to, prom it's still true today. You need a book. Mm. You're only considered a, a serious player when you have a book. Mm -hmm. Brochures and pamphlets and beautiful websites. No, no, no. All Those are all good too. Mm -hmm. But when you have a book, the media pay attention to you. So they offered the course and they called um, about a week before. And they said, well, we have good news and bad news. Which one do you want? And mm -hmm. I said, well, I always want the bad news first. And they said, okay, no one signed up for your course. I said, well, how could there be any good news? I mean, the, the only thing we have to talk about is $65 that I'm now not going to make. So how could there be any good news? And, and they said, well, three people said they wanted to take your course, but they were busy doing other things Saturday morning. And uh, they gave their name and their number. They want you to call them because oh. they, they have a book project that they want to talk to you about. And at first I wasn't going to do it. I thought, ah, it's just going to be a waste of my time. But for some reason, uh, I called the first guy. He was a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. He was a, uh, a local um, industrialist who was involved in a computer program that he invented to help uh, smooth out uh, bottlenecks in manufacturing. I thought, I, have, I, I don't even know what he's talking about. I have no interest <laughs> in this whatsoever. He said, I need you to write my book. Uh, how to win productivity in manufacturing. <laughs> Riveting <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I don't even know how I would write that, let alone, <laughs> I don't know anything about this. Well, that book was sold to Amacom, not Amazon, Amacom, American Management Association Communications Division. When I finished that book, which he paid me $10,000 to write, and he was going to self-publish it, I said, you know, this is not a bad book. Yeah. Let me go uh, try to market this. And I did. So uh, Amicom bought it and gave him like a $15,000 advance. He had paid me 10. So he, he was ahead. The second guy uh, said he was the top divorce attorney in Philadelphia. And Pennsylvania had just uh, approved uh, no fault divorce. And he said, I want my book. I've already written it. And I, it, it's a divorce, your fault, my fault, no fault. And I, I need this book to get media. And I said, I don't really like divorce. I'm not against divorce. I understand divorce, uh, but I, I, I don't want to write about, I don't want my name on a book about divorce. And he said, well, your name won't be on the book. I just need you to edit it for me and help me promote it. Another $10,000 from him. The third guy, when I called him said, I'm a franchisor. I had no clue. I had to, I grabbed for the dictionary on my desk to look up that word. It wasn't in the dictionary. And then he said, McDonald's. And I said, all right, but what do you do? He said, well, I'm in cooperative direct mail advertising. <laughs> Again, this is like how to win productivity in manufacturing. <laughs> Who would want to read about cooperative direct mail advertising? Well, think Valpac, think mm -hmm. Money Mailer. This company had happened to be called Trimark. And they were like, I don't know, the, the unknown, uh, whatever the unknown brand is in the burger uh, industry at any time, that was Trimark because Valpac was huge and out of St. Petersburg and Money Mailer was coming on strong. And Trimark had like 50 franchisees in Wilmington, Delaware, a uh, home of the new president of the United States, right. as, <laughs> as we're talking. And um, so I said, you know, uh, Mr. Kinch, uh, the franchisor, uh, he actually said, well, just come and talk to me. I'll, I'll be at my beach home this weekend. And I said, okay, I'll drive down. I Why not, right? See how the other half lives. <laughs> and in, in my, uh, it was a, uh, oh, I forget uh, the brand of the car, but it had no air conditioning. It was August. It was filthy, <laughs> uh, humid uh, Philadelphia weather. And anyway, let's go see how the other half lives. <laughs> so we talked about it sitting on the beach. And I said, I, you know, I just don't see why anyone would want to read about cooperative. So I, I wasn't out there just, you know, give me $10,000 and I'll write anything. Mm -hmm. It had to be, I had to be, have some passion about it. And I did about cooperative direct mail advertising. On the way home, the heat finally and the humidity finally got to me, hit myself on the head and said, you idiot. The <laughs> book isn't about cooperative direct mail advertising. It's mm -hmm. about franchising. Yeah. Well, I had to wait until this was uh, Saturday, I think. 
So I had to wait until Monday when the local library opened and I could run over there and go to the card catalog, look up franchising, find out <laughs> nobody had written about franchising. I called him immediately, Mr. Kinch, I'm so sorry. Here's what the book is about, it's franchising. And uh, he said, great, when can you get started? And there was another $10,000. But with each of these books, I, I said, okay, this is my business of the future. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue teaching, uh, but I'm, I'm going to do this consulting work. I'm going to write books for people and I'll write four or five of these a year, pick up my teaching uh, salary and uh, I'm in good shape. Well, when the franchising book came out and I spent six months writing it, didn't know how to spell the word franchising when I started, <laughs> interviewed a hundred people with help of the IFA, lawyers, franchisors, franchisees, mm -hmm. all kinds of consultants and advisors and international people as well. So I had a good story about franchising. And when that book came out, um, they did a, um, the publisher did a, a phoner, a series of radio phoners around the country. And, you know, it, so uh, it's like Zoom, you can be anywhere and you can be heard and seen. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was doing phoners for this, uh, for franchising the inside story. Uh, and then the phone would ring from somebody like, uh, let's say, Rebecca Monet calls, uh, a known consultant in the business. And she said, I, I need some help writing whatever. Can you help me? You know, I could do that. Uh, mailboxes, et cetera, called and said, could you come and speak to our convention about uh, how franchisees should be marketing? So, yeah, I'm sure I could do that. <laughs> Janny King, could you write an operations manual? Sure, I could write it. I had to go look <laughs> it up, find out what is an operations manual? But can you write a monthly newsletter? And before I knew it, uh, I had a dozen clients. And then the IFA called and said, would you promote the international trade missions with uh, Peter Holt, who uh, is going to go on like four or five trade missions a year with a dozen franchisors. He needs somebody to go in advance, work with the media, work with the uh, US Commerce Department, uh, work with the franchisors, get them ready for interviews, bring in media. Wow, that, so suddenly franchising became my life. In 85, the day I got my PhD, and the university said, well, we're going to promote you now and we're going to give you $3,000 more a year. And Ooh. I said, no, I'm resigning. And <laughs> nobody could believe that, including my family, because yeah. to be a college professor and I love being in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll come back when I can afford to come back to a university. But I had made $100,000 that year between I took a sabbatical to finish my doctorate. And uh, while I was writing my dissertation, I was doing all this consulting and I made $100,000 that year. It's like, you know, this is too much fun and too easy. It wasn't really, I had passion for the writing and passion for a lot of the books I went on to write, but uh, the real passion was in the classroom. But that's how uh, franchising, the, the media would actually say on these phoners, uh, don't go away. We'll be right back. And we've got the world authority on franchising, Dr. John Hayes. John Hayes. I would laugh thinking, I've never worked for a franchise company. I'm not a franchisor. I'm not a franchisee. Now, I've done all that since that time. But I, I was just a writer, just yeah. a journalism graduate who, who could go research and put stuff together and write a book. And they called me the world authority. Well, fake news existed long before Trump. It went way back <laughs> in time. Well, you know, uh, because what's, I was what's not awesome about that is that, you know, I, I wrote a story one time called the year showing up or something, the year of yes, where I said yes to things I didn't want to do yeah. and didn't know how to do. And then suddenly yeah. all these things happened. Yes. And it's like, you had this year of yes, you did all of the, you said yes to all these opportunities yeah. that were a little foreign to you. Yes, exactly. And then somebody gives you that title that you call fake news. But my attitude is when someone gives you that title, you claim it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Somebody called me, um, I have a book about divorce. It's about dating after divorce uh -huh. with my name on it. And uh, it got it got some publicity and, and John Tesh called me a relationship expert. So that day I went on my profile on the Huffington Post on LinkedIn and I changed it to relationship expert. I thought, well, if he says it, it must be true. Yeah, exactly. So how much of you, we're talking with the listeners out there listening to a story like this and you ending up where you never thought you would be. Yeah. Um, what, what would you impart to someone 
you know, in a place that, to be open about those opportunities? And what did you uh, learn I, I, through those decisions? I think that's the word, uh, being open mm -hmm. to opportunity. You know, I, I, I grew up, uh, my mother was one of nine. My father was one of nine. Uh, we were an Irish, Italian, Catholic family. And so I grew up I wanted to be a priest in the eighth grade. And actually I left for the seminary at the end of the eighth grade. The seminary kicked me out. <laughs> so, so, many, so many little Irish, Italian, Catholic boys want to be a priest, right? right? Well, it didn't work. And then when I got kicked out of the seminary and had to come back to the ninth grade where my friends, my classmates had already given me, I don't know, $20 or something as a going away gift out of the eighth grade. They wanted the $20 back. <laughs> You're not supposed to be here. Well, then I discovered girls in high school. Oh my. So, you know, I changed those uh, plans. Oh, and, real quick. Uh, That'll do it to you. <laughs> yes, exactly. That, that, so I decided to go in another. And so being, you know, the circumstances, God opens the doors. I, mean, I give all that credit to God. I, I have never, there were, you know, like the Titus Center, when we get to talking about that, I didn't plan that. I, I didn't know it didn't exist. So it wasn't a job I could apply for. In fact, jobs that I applied for, I didn't get. Mm -hmm. um, the call came out of nowhere that said, would you be interested in doing? Yeah. Wow. Never thought of that. Write a book about whatever. Never thought about that. I would have never guessed. You know, Taming Your Turmoil was one of my early books. It's written with a psychiatrist from the University of Pennsylvania. Transitions of adult life was what it, it was all about. I, would, I could not write that kind of book. I needed the expert mm -hmm. and I was just the writer, right. you know, which also put me in a, and when I say just the writer, like, you know, we, we don't know anything and we don't have any talent, but of course we do. <laughs> but being open to the possibilities is what a lot of people miss because Parents do this to kids all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to be a doctor. Right. Well, they don't want to be a doctor. Uh, I had, um, I remember this uh, very well-to-do attorney uh, came to see me. I, I, I was the president and chairman of the board of Home Besters of America, the We Buy Ugly Houses franchise. Mm -hmm. So I was on their board. The founder, my good friend and client died and asked me to succeed him. That's how I got into that position. I didn't apply for that job, never intended to become a franchisor. But this attorney brought his college senior son to me to say, we need to be in real estate. Uh, and I'm, I want to buy a Homevestors franchise for my son. Well, I could tell by reading the son that he didn't want to be in real or something was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, I finally got rid of the father somehow. I asked somebody to come and take him on a tour. I said, I, I think I said, I want to talk to your son for a moment. And the son said to me, this is, this is what my dad wants me to do. Mm -hmm. This is not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So parents do this. Teachers do this to kids. You're cut out for this. Well, I, you know, I had the advantage. I wasn't cut out for anything. <laughs> my mother said, if you're going to be lucky, if you can get a job pumping gasoline. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Anything I did was going to be higher than that. Right. So I, I was open to all kinds of uh, possibilities. Yeah. And, and again, you know, the things I applied for, I wanted to be a priest. So I go to the seminary and they say, nope, you're going home. They read you <laughs> like a book. <laughs> right. Yes, I do find it fascinating that, that, like you said, the doors just kept opening and it's like God went ahead of you to open those doors. But it also required you, like Elizabeth said, to say yes. So there was a part of you that knew oh. this was the next place. This was the next yeah. step that you, you trusted that. And I think many of us have that kind of, let's call it intuition or still small voice or whatever it is that says yes. And then our fear or our parents or our teachers or certain tests say we should be doing this instead. So we don't yeah. say yes to that still small voice yeah. or, or that kind of direction. So somehow yeah. you've had that and it sounds like you've had it all of your life. Yeah, uh, I, I, I like adventure. And I, I was married for almost 47 years to a, a woman who unfortunately got leukemia and died uh, a few years ago. And she was adventuresome as well. 
-hmm. And Kuwait is another good example that, you know, I, I had no, Joanne and I had no desire to live outside the United States anywhere for, we love traveling, but go live outside of the United States. Okay. Well, maybe London, that would be a lot of fun. Um, maybe Canada, that's a little, maybe Mexico. Okay. A little more danger there, but Kuwait in the middle East. And again, I was at the end of my business career. And I said, when I can afford to go back to a university, I will. And that came in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, when the economy had was in a slump. We had just sold Homevestors to Fred DeLuca from Subway, who I wrote, Start Small, Finish Big. I mm -hmm. wrote Subway's book. Uh, and I said, it's time to go back to university. I can afford to do it now, but where? Uh, and kind of because we had kids and grandkids in Dallas, wanted to stay there, uh, but there were op various opportunities. And one day I got a call uh, from Gulf University for Science and Technology. And I said to Joanne, that must be in Mississippi. It's the Gulf. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, yeah. <laughs> and I said, but I didn't apply for a job at a golf university. So I called the number, which was in St. Louis that they gave me. And they said, well, we are uh, affiliated with uh, the University of Missouri, St. Louis, but golf university is the first private university in Kuwait. And wow. I said, Kuwait? <laughs> no, <Kuwait>? yeah. <laughs> I'd already been to Saudi Arabia and knew that my wife, First of all, you know, women, Western women, are, what they quickly said, no, 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 we're not Saudi Arabia. Your wife is going to love it here. There are a lot of American women here. There are American franchises galore here. We love America. America saved us uh, out of the, you know, the first uh, Bush administration. Um, okay, but, you know, that's a big leap. I'm looking for, well, they said, we want to give you a dual appointment. And I couldn't get this in the United States. They wouldn't hire me in a business school at the time because I didn't have a business degree. I still don't have a business degree, but I had more business experience than five or six of the faculty put together. So I, I was being told, no, you're gonna to have to go teach journalism. Okay, well, I'd love to teach journalism, but that doesn't make any money teaching journalism. I've already been there. <laughs> and well, you, your degrees are in journalism and history. And you know, that's, that, no, we, well, they, Kuwait said, we wanna offer you a dual appointment in our business school teaching marketing and franchising and in our communication school teaching the MBA class, uh, the communications course in the MBA class. And there are no taxes in Kuwait. <laughs> so you, you can earn, you, you still have to pay, you don't have to pay any tax to the United States until you make $100,000, then you start paying tax. But Kuwait collects no tax. Mm. So, and then, there, I mean, there again, God opened the door that I had no, I would have, if, if I had seen a job advertised in Kuwait, I would have just skipped over it. I wouldn't have sent my CV and they got my CV. I, I don't really know to this day. I stayed seven years in Kuwait. And again, uh, you know, in the sixth year, my wife died mm. and I went back for the, in the sixth year after she died, I went back to finish uh, teaching the uh, spring semester. And I walked into the apartment there and knew that this just wasn't going to work, being there by myself and uh, travel was a great part of it. We, I went to Jerusalem five times, it was so easy from Kuwait and traveled all over the Middle East. Uh, and people would say, aren't you scared? Said, I'm more frightened in the United States of somebody shooting me or knifing me or doing something to me than I, than you, there are no guns. Well, there are guns in Kuwait, but nobody gets shot. Nobody's murdered. It's not exactly true. There are some things that happen. <laughs> not, not like not in the same way as it is no. here. Not as random. No, <laughs> no. Uh, you know, drugs are outlawed. They're there, but you know, you just don't have the craziness um, in Kuwait. I, I mean, you could go through. You could carry your water bottle through the through the security at the airport <laughs> because it's partly. They, I mean, they knew it was safe. So the, the, the terrorists were in the United States. They weren't over in uh, Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Kuwaitis don't like terrorists either. So we felt very comfortable. We traveled a lot. Well, she died and I didn't know how I was going to continue. 
one week after I returned, I got an email from Ray Titus, who had been my client for a number of years, um, always sponsors me to speak at expos around the world. And he sent an email and said, I just gave a million and a half dollars to a little Christian university in West Palm Beach to establish a center that will teach students about franchising. And the president of the university said, we need a PhD who knows how to teach franchising. Do you, you know anybody? And he said, yeah, but he's in Kuwait. We're going to have to get him back. <laughs> so uh, he knew I wanted to stay in Kuwait 10 years because that's how you got the biggest payout. For every year you're in Kuwait, they give you a month and a half salary to take home. And I went and, and it was capped at, at uh, 15, uh, 10 years. So you got 15 months pay to come home. Great. Uh, so I, that was my goal. But again, God had another idea, another plan. And I came back after in my, at the end of my seventh year to start the Titus Center uh, for franchising. I always wanted to teach at a Christian university. Didn't have that opportunity. Uh, wanted to live downtown in a city and walk to the university. <laughs> and I did that with little West Palm Beach. I don't live downtown anymore, but I did for the first two and a half or so years that I lived here. Uh, I love the, it's a beautiful little campus along the water, small university, but the business school is major. And everybody now knows about the Titus Center for Franchising. We've just had an amazing run with what we've been able to do in three and a half years of development. Uh, and we're continuing even during the pandemic to have great things happening for it. Things that I don't, again, I mean, it just, they, things fall in my lap. I know it's not that easy and I know it doesn't happen exactly that way. Circumstances come together. And, for, for um, you. you know, it's interesting. Uh, Elizabeth and I frequently talk about themes in people's lives. And it's, there's clearly a theme in your life of doors opening to wonderful opportunities for you to use your gifting and your talents. And I, I want to actually go dig more deeply into the Titus Center for Franchising. I have been incredibly impressed with what you are doing there and how you pulled, uh, you know, industry minds together, franchise brains together to support you in this mission of educating the next generation of franchise professionals. Uh, and you've had a huge impact just in the short three and a half years or so that you've been doing this. So tell me how you've been able to rally the forces like that and what the ultimate goal of the Titus Center for Franchising is. And of course, how we might be able to help. Yeah. Well, ultimately we, we're educating the, the future generations uh, for franchising. Uh, I have 30 students currently, 30 some students, who are earning a concentration in franchising along with their business degree. So they, they get a degree in marketing or international business or accounting, but they tack onto it 12 credit hours in franchising, including an internship that they have to do at a franchise company. And there are three academic courses that they take uh, with me, principles of franchising, case studies in franchising, and franchise management and operations. And if they complete that concentration, it's not a minor, but it's like a minor. It, it goes on their transcript that they earned the concentration in franchising. And that sets them up at any number of companies around the world. And we have franchisors from Germany specifically uh, who did hire one of our graduates who wasn't able to happen yet because of uh, COVID. Uh, so franchisors and franchisees and suppliers would rather hire someone out of college, entry level, who says, oh, I know about the disclosure document. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know about discovery days. Oh, in my internship, I did this project of blah, 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 blah. And wow, you know about, you're hired. So my students have no trouble getting hired. Uh, they have multiple opportunities. Uh, those who want to be hired, 97% of them want to own a franchise, hmm. but they, they're, most of them, it's so far the way it's going, uh, they take a job 
with a franchisor or a franchisee. And a, many of them, many of our students from PBA, 17 of our, before me, there were 17 graduates of PBA who became franchisees of Chick-fil-A because we have a local Chick-fil-A franchisee who recruits them. He's employed more than 1,000 of our students since he's been open here. And he puts them in the leadership program and gets them Chick-fil-A franchises. So wow. I have two or three students on that track now. Then I've got um, three students who already bought franchises. Wow. And then others who are working at franchise companies. Well, I mean, this, this was the perfect um, last stop for me. You know, I, I was going to come home from Kuwait and just write and speak and retire, essentially. But I came back into something that really, wow, you need passion. And this is where teaching and franchising combined that I can help young people. It was Zig Ziglar who said, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. Mm -hmm. That's what teachers do. And that's what franchisors do and franchisees do. So I, I'm in a, a great uh, opportunity. Again, the door open, I had nothing to, I didn't create it, I didn't apply for it. It's not something that I did. And then it continued. The president of the university, they didn't tell me this when, 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 we were, when I was being interviewed. One day after I'd been hired, he said, well, you need to have a, an advisory board and not an advisory board that we're going to pay them. They're going to pay you. Mm. And I said, you know, I got to admit, I've been on some boards. And in fact, when I was on the Dwyer Group board, in franchising, that was one of the best opportunities I ever had financially. And uh, he said, no, they're gonna pay you. They're gonna make a contribution to the university and have the pleasure of serving on your board. I, said, I don't think so, Mr. <laughs> President. Um, but I decided, well, um, okay. I, I've been at this since 1979, meeting people in franchising and working with them and helping them. I've worked for hundreds of brands through those years. So I thought, well, maybe I, I got eight friends, surely, that I could get on my board. And they would, and I would ask for a two-year appointment, $2,500 a year. Mm -hmm. So $5,000, it's, it's a gift. It's a donation. It's a write-off to, to a university teaching franchising. That's not a big, a big hurdle. So I said, but to get eight, I put my marketing hat on. I'm going to have to send uh, about 24 letters to get eight. I sent 24 letters, all 24 said yes. And they wow. came back and said, you need to ask so-and-so. So I have a board of, I think I just recruited Peter Holt just the other day from yes. um, the joint chiropractic. Um, prior to that, I, it, this is in a pandemic when I really wasn't in a recruitment mode, but a 60 some year old Cuban immigrant who owns 230 Wendy's in Fort Lauderdale he contacted me and he said, I need to give back to franchising. Can I be on your board? Wow. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> burger Five, an up and coming burger uh, mm -hmm. brand that's going to go public. They contacted me. We'd like to recruit your students as interns. They're, they're based here in North Palm Beach. And um, the uh, third one, oh, a, a parent who owns a Chick-fil-A in Washington, D.C., graduate of PBA from the 1980s, brought his daughter in August to begin her freshman year at PBA, saw a sign that said Titus Center for Franchising. Somebody said, yes, call Dr. Hayes. He calls me, says, what is that about? <laughs> He's on my board. He said, I, I, I need a good reason to come and see my daughter a couple times a year, so I'll come to your meetings. <laughs> so uh, those, those are the newest members of my board. I want to see Rebecca Monet's name on my board <laughs> as well, participating. Um, so it, and then people say, you got a 40 member board. That's too many. That's too many people. Well, no, you don't understand. I mean, I don't talk to all 40 every month, even. Some of them I don't talk to until I see them at the next meeting. But a handful of them who are really involved, like Jeff Sieber at Fran Fund and AJ Titus, who is Ray Titus's son at Sinorama and Red Boswell, who, who's now an MBA student earning a certificate in franchising as well. Not that he needs one, but uh, th these are people, yeah, I'm talking to them daily, but because I need that. 
uh, they they yeah. build into they they figure into my passion for educating uh, people. We're we're now going to launch the franchise academy because everywhere I speak, people will say to me, "How do I take your courses on franchising?" But I I don't want to be a college student. I already have my degree. Mm -hmm. I'm 50 years old, and you know I want to learn more about franchising. And I live in Kuwait. Right. Well, unfortunately, you can't uh, without right. being a PBA student. But now soon. You can because the Franchise Academy will be 40 hours of education for professionals in franchising. And we are getting ready to roll this out soon. It'll be a certificate program. And, uh, uh, you know, this, this is partly inspired by people when they come up to me in my audiences, but also inspired by my board saying, we yeah. need mm -hmm. more education. We need more. How do we get people in the Middle East, in South America, throughout Europe, who want to use franchising as a methodology. How yeah. do we how do we reach well, and, them? And John, we've got to wrap it up because we're running out of time. But I do want to, speaking to that, um, let us know how people can find out more about that, reach out to you uh, in terms of the Titus Center, but also the Academy. Give us a contact point so that the people who are watching maybe- Yeah, TitusCenterForFranchising.com, TitusCenterForFranchising.com, mm -hmm. um, or just you know go to the, to the website and contact me by email. There's a form right on there to send me a message at TitusCenterForFranchising.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I feel like there's so much more we could have talked about with you. So we'll, we'll have to have you oh, back in, in 2021 when everything is looking up for all of us. Um, so, but thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It was a great interview. Sure. Thank you, John. Yes, what a beautiful legacy mm -hmm. you are leaving and the opportunity as board members for them to also leave a legacy. It'll be interesting to see 10 years, 20 years, the folks that come out of that and how franchising Amazing. goes to a whole nother level. What a beautiful- We didn't even talk about our endowed scholarships that just oh. amazing, the things we have going well, on. Well, that, that's a good reason for people to reach out to you, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll leave them with that. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Thank you, it was great. What do you think is the number one challenge for franchisors? You got it, getting the right fit franchisee. And as you know, poor fit franchisees are often poor performers. Poor fit franchisees cost more to train and support. Poor fit franchisees are rarely satisfied or compliant, which can lead to validation issues. Not a good place to be. But now there is a solution. Zorical Profiles Scientific Spot On Match Program. Working with top broker groups in franchising, Zorical has created a platform that scientifically matches the broker's candidate to the right fit franchise brand. Spot On Match predicts the compatibility, performance, and viability of a prospective franchisee. Spot On Match gives the franchise development team a data-driven and scientific approach to selling franchises. This is how it works. Zorical works with each franchisor to establish their top performer blueprint. This research assesses current franchisees to determine the key psychographic indicators that separate high performers from mid to low performing franchisees. The final result of the research is the brand's Eclipse Report, which compares prospective franchisees to a franchise system's high performers. Finally, brokers are running a spot-on profile on each of their franchise prospects. These profiles are then scientifically bumped up against the franchisor's high performer algorithms, and the match process begins. Dashboards are built for the franchisor and the broker to make sure the process is smooth and trackable. RightFit matches instantly. Find out how you can be a spot-on match member. Save time. Stop guessing. Start matching. Call Zorical Profiles. Welcome to Women in the Know, where we discuss everything from politics and policy to relationships and marketing. We take the life experiences that we have had, we take the interviews that we have done and the lessons we have learned to share with you so that we can all learn a little something and improve our lives. Today's topic is um, we talked to 
Dr. John Hayes of the Titus uh, Center for Franchising. And he has been one of those people where things just seem to come to him. And he takes those opportunities. So he, we, were, we discussed with him the year of yes, where he accepted a lot of opportunities he was not planning to do. Um, so we wanted to, to kind of delve into that, Rebecca. I mean, what was your, what's your take on his, it's an interesting theme of his life, as we were saying. It is a theme in his life, isn't it? And it's funny because we, we originally said a year of yeses, but it's a lifetime. It was. Yeses yeah. that he was sharing it. It's, it's, a fascinating that he has this strong belief that God goes ahead of him and opens doors, that he has to do very little other than say yes to that opportunity. And then the next door opens. He gave us example after example uh, as a journalist, as a professor, going to Kuwait, the Titus Center franchising, writing all of these uh, books that... Um, he was able to say yes because he trusted mm -hmm. that this door that was open was meant for him, especially since it was using his talents and his gifts. But I think what I find interesting is something that you had brought up and he had brought up, and that is that sometimes parents and teachers uh, are kind of guiding us in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we say no or don't even see a door because of sort of being pushed a particular career or whatever it is. And, and John, as a professor himself, is saying, don't do that. You know, have an open mind to what might be possible in the direction for your, for your lives. It's such a great lesson, especially uh, for those of us who have young adult children. Um, I have a daughter who thought she, she said when she was like eight years old that she wanted to be a doctor and she was committed. She committed to that idea for years and then it became the expectation. And I think because I was the stepmother, I was a safe space to come say, you know, how, wh what do you think about this? I mean, I'm, I'm always said I wanted to do this, but I don't want to let mom and dad down. You know, the dad is my husband or her mother is, is her mother or biological mother. And I said, you know, you don't have to be committed to a decision you made when you were eight. Easy for me to say, because I came in later, right? I didn't know her at eight. Um, and I was, I, I had, I felt very careful about not pushing in any direction, but I just said, look at what you're doing. What are your extracurriculars? What are the things that you're drawn to? And they were all to do with writing. And I said, do you find it interesting that, that those are the things you choose to fill your time with and the things you seem to be good at, and you're not going to volunteer at a hospital, you're not a candy striper, you're not a whatever, you, you know, things you could do. And I said, I think that you might want to let that guide you. And, um, you know, it took her a while and she finally told her parents and of course they were fine with it. But um, when you're a kid, you're kind of, you feel, yeah. she pigeonholed herself and then felt the expectation of that. Um, so allowing young people to, to explore what they're good at and where their passion takes them. And he had no idea what he was going to do with a history degree and a in history journalism. And philosophy and journalism. I mean, you know, what, what do you do with some of that? You know, it's not a guaranteed job. Yeah. It was a fascinating story mm -hmm. of how, it, how it went. And, and you're right. You kind of have to get in touch with uh, some of those passions we see it in franchising where a successful corporate executive steps you know to the plate of business ownership thinks about it and it's sometimes the first time they have thought about something other than just putting food on the table and providing a home for their family to who am i mm -hmm. and what do i want and where are my passions and where are my talents sometimes it's the first time a successful corporate executive is saying, what do I want? Mm -hmm. Who am I? How can I use this, these God-given gifts in a way to build uh, a business, which is why I love franchising. Uh, and for many, it's not until they're 50 years old. I mean, imagine if we could learn these things at 18 and 19 and 22, which is what John Hayes is doing at the Titus Center for Franchising. He's opening up some of those doors for future business owners, or at least someone thinking about being a franchisee or a franchise professional, to stop and think, like you said with your daughter, um, who are you? Mm -hmm. What gives you joy? What gives you passion? What gives you, what, where are your What talents? are you good at? So, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. 
sometimes kids yeah. don't know. You know, sometimes adults don't know. <laughs> no. We figure no. it out by showing up. Figure it out by showing up. That's like a book. <laughs> that sounds like a book. Figure it out by showing up. Yep. <laughs> I'm write that down. We'll write that down and do something with it. Yeah, we're going to do a whole topic on that. This is, this is brilliant. All right. So now that we solved the world's problems around passion and purpose and and talent and all of that. Uh, this is, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up the women in no until next week when we see you again. The Franchise Woman is a bi-monthly digital magazine that empowers women as they navigate the franchising industry by providing relevant news, tools, advice, and inspiration. We are a resource for women who are seeking to own their own businesses, improve their existing businesses, find creative solutions, and take advantage of franchise opportunities. We feature women in the business who best exemplify our ideals and have something to teach our readers. In addition to our exclusive articles relating to the female entrepreneur, we also feature brands that are geared for women. Women have become the fastest growing sector in business ownership and have become a powerful, influenceable force fueling the economy. The Franchise Women will give you the news that is relevant to you to help you navigate the path of successful franchise ownership. By women, for women, and about women. We are the Franchise Woman. Join us today at www.thefranchisewoman.com. Welcome to Ask Beck and Liz, where no topic is off limits. We want to answer your questions about business and life and everything in between. Send your questions to ask at beckandliz.com. That's ask at beckandliz.com. Question for today, Elizabeth? actually stems from a conversation we have with uh, Dr. John Hayes from the Titus Center for Franchising. Uh, and it was this idea of saying yes. So my question is, um, how do we know when we should say yes to something? Why do we not say yes to certain things? I guess it's kind of a two part uh, question. So let me put it to you. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think um, I had a similar experience uh, that John had in terms of saying yes I kind of had a year of yes one year um, and I think one of the reasons we don't say yes is fear it's it's fear and it's familiarity we, we like to be in familiar situations where we feel like we know what we're doing and if you say yes to something outside of that then you have the possibility of failure <laughs> um, so that's that's a scary thing for a lot of people and I think you know listening to that little inner voice, like, why, why should you say yes? Um, I agreed to write a script for a pageant. This was my year of yes. I was freelancing with a company and she, her family runs a pageant. And I've, I think I've talked about it before. I said yes to writing the script to build that relationship with her. Um, and that's where I met the, the man who published my book. Um, he was the essay judge. He walked up and said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a writer. And well, do, what are you writing? And I said, well, I'm kind of working on this book about my online dating and divorce. And he's like, well, I'm a book publisher. After this pageant's over, let's have lunch and I'll read it. And within a couple of months, I had a book on Amazon. Um, and since saying yes to that, have built very strong relationships and, and volunteered in ways that I didn't, I'm not a pageant girl, wasn't my thing. So I think when you, when you do that, when you have that little inkling, like maybe I should say yes to this, but then you hold back because you're like, but what if it doesn't work out? you should just say yes. And it's not always going to work out, but you're going to have an experience that you either learn from or benefit from, <laughs> you know, if, if it works out. And the learning is clearly a benefit too. But what do you think? What's your take on that? I think I agree with you that it is fear that stops us from saying yes, even when we get a strong intuition that says, here, this door is opening. It's an unfamiliar door but it feels like I'm supposed to go that, you know, but things aren't lining up because the fear part is in the way. But I wonder um, if ego has something to hmm. do with, or this kind of identity that we see ourselves a certain way, right? And we sort of hold this picture, this identity of ourselves. And if we go into another direction, we say yes to something that's unfamiliar or or doesn't quite line up with the identity that we have of ourselves, that, that the fear is pretty big at that point. That mm -hmm. if I go this direction, it's gonna be counter the way that I identify myself and, and that feels unsafe. Never mind 
uh, others see me or as, as this whatever identity it is, because I truly believe that a lot of our decisions are to hold ourselves within a particular identity that we have. In neurolinguistics, we, we basically call it a prime concern that we deliberately do everything possible to hold on to who I think I am, mm -hmm. right? And that includes holding on to my victimization or my uh, weaknesses and my insecurities because that's how I identify right. myself. I think we don't say yes sometimes out of, I, I'm calling it ego, but maybe the word is identity. It's, our, it's holding on to our identity. Well, and not only that, to, to further your point, because I know a lot of victims <laughs> in my life, um, to, to take responsibility and move on and make different choices makes it your responsibility. Then you can't be the victim because you've made it. You so to get yourself to that point, you have to own it. And that's hard. I had to do that after my divorce. I've had this talk with my kids. Like there was a minute where I remember thinking I could either be angry for the rest of my life and no one would blame me. It was not a fun divorce. Um, but how much, how was that going to impact me and my kids going forward? I could either be angry and hold on to it and be mad and be a victim. Or I could say from this moment forward, it's my responsibility and whatever happens to me is on me. Talk about a scary decision, but I knew that for my, I didn't want to raise victims. I wanted to raise people who took responsibility for where they were, even if it wasn't necessarily their fault and how they arrived there. You know, I think that's a hard thing for people to overcome when it's not your fault, when something happens to you, it's easy to stay in that victim mode, you know, and it's safer it's because then you don't take the risk of trying to change it. It's an identity that I'm a victim. This, this thing happened to me and therefore the rest of my life isn't going to work. I, I have an example consistent with what you were just talking about of someone who's been in a business for eight years and has never made money. <laughs> and part of me goes, hello, maybe it's time to go into a different business, sell that business, go another direction. This person is absolutely miserable, uh, doesn't even enjoy the business anymore. It's not making money. Uh, you know, it's kind of good money after bad money, mm -hmm. but refuses to close the business and do something else. And I absolutely believe it's this identity that I am a owner of such and such business and the world knows me that way. I see myself mm -hmm. that way. And an unwillingness to say, oops, that didn't work. Plan B, let's yeah. go do something differently. That the, the, the identity is holding on to something, even though that thing is a sinking ship. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm a hold, hold on to it. Yeah, and it's a fascinating phenomenon. And then it is. It's a crazy phenomenon. <laughs> and I think we want to probably do make a note to take this conversation uh, further at a later date because it really is something in business and in life mm -hmm. that we frequently get stuck in. Uh, and John was so beautiful in how he just trusted and said yes to everything. Um, and again and again, it went the right direction. The minute it no longer was working, another door opened. His eyes were open because he had faith. Well, and here's what I want to ask him next time he comes back. I'm going to make this note too. When has it not worked out? Did he, did he just leave those experiences out or has he just had this constant faith that it always did? And so it did, or what, how does he cope when he has to make that shift? Cause it's not exactly what he thought or wanted. Just, just a little right. segment. <laughs> exactly. We're going to have to have him back and ask him. Mean, he did talk about not financially things weren't working and, and 